Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the final day of senior project presentations. This is such an incredible moment in the year when we get to honor and celebrate the work of our seniors as a community. The journey of self-exploration that our seniors have embarked on is truly inspiring and truly important, especially in this time when we are all being challenged to look inside ourselves and assess how our thoughts and beliefs influence the way we interact with others. Our seniors have been on a year-long quest of doing that work and it shines through in their projects. They have been able to will their way through these difficult times and create something of beauty. For our final day of presentations, we have three wonderful presenters. Hannah Berkman is presenting Art as Empowerment. Ariel Murtaugh is presenting In Transition, The Art of Memoir Writing. And Kashem Williams will be presenting making and playing the djembe. Please write your questions in the Q&A and I will read them to the students at the conclusion of their presentations. And without further ado, Hannah will begin with art as empowerment. Hi everyone. This is my first year at Green Meadow. I grew up attending Solomon Schechter Jewish Day Schools. Oh, can you allow me to share a screen? This is my first year at Green Meadow. I grew up attending Solomon Schechter Jewish day schools all my life through the beginning of high school. The day school system is very rigid and there's little emphasis on creativity and the making of art. In fact, the arts wing at my former high school was being taken over by the science and technology department when I left at the end of my sophomore year. It was not until I left Schechter and entered Rockland Country Day School that I was exposed to the importance of making art in life. Mike Avezzano, our photography teacher, was a huge inspiration to me. He introduced me to a new world of creativity and made me feel so good about my work. We also had a beautiful art studio and a great art teacher, Michelle Summers, who allowed me to experiment with all different medium freely. In my photographic work, I concentrated on portraits. These are some of the photos we took on a beautiful day on our campus. You might recognize Arno and some of the other students who are from RCDS. I was also a part of a joint project between RCDS and Brooklyn Community College, shooting portraits of multicultural students. The photos were exhibited in the Holocaust Museum at the college and appeared in a local newspaper. I was also inspired by a paper I wrote on protest art made by women in Central Asia. I realized that art can be dangerous. Sometimes it needs to be dangerous in order to affect change. After RCDS closed, I knew that I needed to be in a school that would nurture my newfound love for art. When visiting Green Meadow and seeing the entire arts building, I knew this would be the right place for me. I had the opportunity to take bookbinding with Ms. Fulte in the beginning of the year. This taught me the importance of perseverance in making art. My eyes were opened to what learning a craft is really about. Art changed and saved my life. I wanted to use it to make a difference in people's lives, just like it had in my own. Art is my outlet. I use it to empower myself. I find any type of creating is soothing and clears my mind. When I'm working on a project and I'm in my most creative state of being, that is when I'm most in touch with myself and my emotions. My hopes, my dreams, and my passion is driven by creativity. 
I love the fact that everything we do reflects the world around us. We use inspiration from others while inspiring others at the same time. For my senior project, I used art making in two different ways. The first was to empower other people. I had the opportunity to work with people with Alzheimer's as well as those who are cognitively impaired. I also used it to uplift a Holocaust survivor. The second way was to empower myself. I undertook a number of artistic projects, including a class in darkroom photography, a ceramics class at RCC, and I also came up with some of my own projects, like jewelry making and sketching. Unfortunately, because of COVID, documenting some of the work was difficult. Some pieces are unavailable to me. There was also issues in privacy and working with the Alzheimer's patients. I found my work with the Alzheimer's patients to be one of the most meaningful aspects of my senior project. The Alzheimer's group that I worked with was run through Rockland Jewish Family Service. The group met every two weeks. We used art therapy to have engaging conversations with all the participants, all of whom in this group were men. I was able to see, I was able to see the different ways the art therapy worked for different people, and that I was able to see their minds at work. I witnessed the decisions they made in their work. The personal connections formed by building and creating are the strongest bonds you can make. I found that applying the energy of the people in the room to what you're working on together allows for the piece to truly have this connection woven throughout. We all sat around one long table Many people think Alzheimer's patients have little cognition, but there's so much more to them. In working with Alzheimer's patients, I found it is important to connect with them on different levels. The therapist I worked with, also my mentor, Eve Freeman, uses art extensively in her therapeutic work. Eve would put different objects on the table for group participants to draw inspiration from. During one session, Eve put out a large branch I encouraged one of the patients, Jim, to decorate it with me. Together, we allowed this piece of wood to become a story. We decided it was a snake. This story was relevant to Jim because he grew up in Alabama with snakes. This story operated on multiple levels. Firstly, it was about how we created this snake together. And it was also a story of the object itself, an animal in nature. We also created Valentine's Day presents for those we love. Each participant was given a silk-like piece of fabric and an array of colors to choose from, to blend and decorate the fabric however they wished. This was an opportunity for all the group members to share some of the positivity they received through the group and use it to uplift others. They were able to share their artwork with their wives and thank their wives and do something for the people who take care of them. This allowed them to give in addition to receive. What I truly loved about this experience is that I got to know each of the patients as individuals. We also used fruit as an inspiration. Fruit is great because it has so many different textures and colors. And what we did here was we painted the fruit and pressed it onto the paper to create different designs. Eve and the other therapists leading the group were extremely helpful. Overall, it was most inspiring to see the way different people absorb the environment in connection to their current state and watch them reflected onto the paper or other medium. It is important for people suffering from Alzheimer's to be in touch with their emotions and to have an outlet. Since many of them cannot write, art is perfect. Anyone can do art, and it is sensory, which allows you to be in the moment. When the past and their ability to remember is so unclear, they must celebrate every moment of their lives. While this group ran, I also had the opportunity to work with adults from group homes. A group home is a place where adults with developmental disabilities 
can live together semi-independently. We worked on a project that we selected as a small group. While this experience was cut short through the virus, what struck me most was the kindness the group members displayed towards one another, as well as the enthusiasm they exhibited towards the different project ideas. Some of our ideas included clay, painting, and music. One of the group members had a deep love for animals, so we wanted to be sure to incorporate that. It was uplifting to see the level of commitment they had to the work. In the end, we decided to create a charity box out of recycled soda bottles. It would look like a pig. The bottles would be the body, the caps would be the legs, and we would create ears from paper. Although we did not get to finish this project, we had the opportunity to complete several steps and overcome challenges together. One challenge we encountered was cutting the plastic soda bottles, but with little grit and perseverance, we were able to move forward. After an abrupt ending to these groups, my mentor gave me the opportunity to illustrate a book she was creating for a Holocaust survivor. The project was part of a national grant to allow survivors to share their stories and express themselves. I created illustrations to go with quotes that came from the survivor's interview. And this collection will be given to him as the birthday gift. This illustration represents a quote where he was talking about how anything he gave for his wife, she would do the same for him. This illustration goes along with the quote where he talks about how the only crime he committed was being Jewish. Their Jewish star is wrapped around the handcuffs which represent his lack of freedom. And this illustration is from a quote where he said, a beautiful woman stays beautiful her whole life. The different moons represent time going by and the woman is forever beautiful. Some of my illustrations were an attempt to capture life during the war, while others were to show later more positive side of his life. In addition to working with others, I also focused on developing my own artistic abilities. I took a class on darkroom photography. Photography has changed how I view everything. It has allowed me to see the beauty in all people Something that seems so simple on the surface, photography has proven to be much more complicated. This was my first time working in the darkroom, and I think it was very successful. We spent two days taking photos. One day was spent indoors in the studio, and the other day was outdoors. I love taking photos outside because of all the interesting things you can see and the natural lighting. On the other hand, I also love working in the studio because you have more control over the shoot. In the class, we all got to know each other well. You must be vulnerable when modeling. You have to trust each other. This trust brought the class closer. And in order to properly photograph someone, you have to understand them. When it comes to developing the images, it is a truly magical process. First, you must develop the negatives. But in order to do this, you must work in complete darkness. Then you enlarge the negative in a dark room and develop the photos. It is so peaceful to hear the sound of the water running and be surrounded by darkness. It gives you the opportunity to fully connect with the process of making your photo come alive. You must be patient. Nothing happens automatically. I also worked with the cyanotype. In order to do this, you mix chemicals together and you paint it onto paper. Then you put it out in the sun with an object over it and allow it to develop over an object. Then you wash the paper for a certain amount of time and watch it come alive. I also experimented with fashion photography this year. 
you may recognize some of these Green Meadows students. This shoot was done at my home and I almost, I built my own studio. I also took a ceramics class that was cut short due to the virus. In this class, I learned different techniques to create pieces by hand. We first learned to make pinch pots and press plates. This is an example of making a press plate. You cut the slab into whatever shape you want and put a hard surface on top. Then you press it into the foam and allow it to become a border. Then you glaze it however you like. This process was pretty simple and straightforward. However, one part that I struggled with was cleaning the edges and smoothing everything out. Much like the dark room, you must be patient. I also got to create a mug that represented something important to me. I based my first mug off the story of Adam and Eve. I created a tree and an apple to put on the mug. I love how this mug turned out. And my patience really paid off. It feels good to be proud of your work. For the last project we did before COVID, we made coil pots. This is an example of a coil pot. However, it is not mine. This was where I had the most fun and really got to demonstrate my creative side. I find that it is really empowering to work with your hands and be able to see what your body is capable of. Feeling the clay on your skin is extremely grounding. I also did some of my own work throughout the year. When quarantine began, I experimented with jewelry making. I used wire and different beads and I tested out different shapes. I made earrings and bracelets and necklaces and gifted them to some of my family members. I also worked on sketching and made portraits and other sketches. This is my nephew Avi, who I decided to draw when he was born. It is a work in progress, but I hope to complete it. And I also worked with poured paint. This is a simple process that comes out really beautiful. You can see the paint spreads out among the canvas in all different textures and shapes. My goal is to eventually become an art therapist. My senior project really gave me a sense of what using art to work with people is about. I had the opportunity to see how it affects me and my own state of mind. This is the book that was created for the Holocaust survivor. And this is some of the images. And this is some of the jewelry that I created. I worked with beads and I also worked with clay. I would like to thank everyone who helped me with this process. My parents who kept me motivated and brought me to the different classes. I'd like to thank Ms. Blythe Swinson who helped me prepare for my presentation and helped me throughout the entire process. I would like to thank Eve, my mentor from Rockland Jewish Family Service who gave me so many opportunities and welcomed me into her work. I'd like to thank Ms. Volpe who supported my whole class and stuck by our side the entire year. And I'd like to thank Ms. Cologne, who gave me support and guidance throughout this project. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was incredible. I can't believe how much you were able to accomplish over the course of the year. So many different forms of artwork, and they were all really beautiful. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, the first question is, what part of your project did you enjoy the most? Um, I'd say 
um, working with the Alzheimer's patients was really incredible because I learned so much. And also the darkroom photography, I've always wanted to do that. And this was finally, I got the opportunity to, and I loved it just as much as I thought I would. Great. Keep the questions coming in. Um, how did this experience change you? Um, it definitely changed me. And I think I've never worked with these types of people before. And I really got a sense of like, just because someone can't communicate in the same way, doesn't mean they can't communicate and doesn't mean they have, they don't have so much to them. What made you want to choose these forms of art? Well, photography I've been doing for a little while and, and I've done a little bit ceramics in my life and I really wanted to continue it. I also reached out to my mentor and she had so many great ideas and I really am appreciative of that. Great. Someone is asking if you can show the book a little bit more, um, The Holocaust Survivor Book. Yeah, sure. So on the top it says, Words of the Survivor. And the illustrations actually come from all different people. So I think that's really beautiful. Um, so this is one of his quotes that says, as you turn the, oh, wait. If you have an ability, use it. And this is the hand knit sweater by Marion Einhorn. Let's see it, yeah. And then he also said, take the opportunity to learn. And this was mine. And it says, I was there for only one crime. I was Jewish. And I'll just show one more. Um, people are tortured and killed for no reason. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, someone else asked if you have a picture of your mug. No, unfortunately I don't because it's at RCC and we didn't know that the class was gonna be ending so I didn't get to take it with me. It seems like you were able to come up with other ways to do your artwork after the formal classes ended. What inspired you to do that? Um, I was bored. <laughs> and I knew that I had to work on my project. So I just like, I went around my house looking for all different materials, trying to think of what I could make. And I just made a mess and made art. Okay, great. Well, thank you again so much, Hannah. You did a great job. And we will be moving on to Arielle next. Okay, right. thank you, Hannah. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Good morning, everyone. For my senior project, I decided that I wanted to write a memoir. And to begin, I wanted to read an excerpt from the body of work that I created this year. My memories are residue from a camera flash, the black and fuzzy haze that clusters around the iris after the click and spark of a photograph. I'm transported sometimes when the lights become too bright. I can't handle the brilliance. All I need is a candle flickering in the darkness the twirling flames guiding me through the black. I drove to my hometown in late August when the summer was at the height of its loneliness. I grew up here. I knew these woods and these fields. I was driving, but I felt as if I was gliding along the underbelly of an immense whale only experiencing the shadow of its form. As I drove, I observed the golden pastures 
undulating beneath the blazing orb in the sky. Small rivers trickled beside the road, hidden under the shadow of a rigid guardrail. Clusters of dandelion seeds swam alongside me like dreams. It was a day that felt intangible somehow. I was drifting through time. My eyes were crusted with sleep and my hair was matted, glistening with jewels of sweat. A gnarled tree marred by the fingers of time bent forward over the road, giving my mind a rest in the blissful shade just for a moment. I was aimless in some respect, but today I was heading toward a certain pulse in the hills, a beckoning whisper. I smiled all the way, tears clouding my vision. My tears were prisms reflecting the rainbow rays of the morning. They were tears of nostalgia and of longing. I finally reached the place that had been calling me. I turned onto my street, the street that held my childhood years in its grasp. The houses that lined the road were unchanging. My world had shifted time and time again, but the houses along Wilhelm Drive remained untouched by the malicious wand of time. There were small changes, of course. Some awnings were painted different colors and new trees were planted. But the place that was seared in the recesses of my memory was still intact. Eventually, I arrived at my old home. The harsh sunlight illuminated every crevice of the house, the house that held my history. Several children were playing in the yard. I parked my car in front of the house, and eventually they noticed that I was lingering. They seemed inquisitive at first and then fearful. They ran inside, slamming the green front door behind them, the door that I knew so well. I stayed there for a moment longer, soaking in the view. I considered walking up the long driveway and knocking on that green door, but I felt as if it wasn't time. I wasn't ready. And so I turned around and left as a ghost. That passage was from the preface of my memoir. When I first decided to write a memoir in the fall of this year, I pictured myself writing a hefty 300 page book and just having that sit in my lap by the time that June rolled around. If you know me, this lofty and unrealistic goal should not surprise you. And if you know me, you also shouldn't be surprised that the current body of work that I do have is actually not 300 pages. Who would have thought? Memoirs are limitless. And that was such a freeing realization for me. Like a poem, they can be spoken, drawn, sung. They aren't limited to one medium. And I realized this early in the writing process of my memoir, and that was really a beautiful thing for me. For this piece, I wanted to synthesize my deepest thoughts and feelings and channel that into an authentic reflection of the short amount of life that I've lived thus far. On the cusp of 2020, I wanted the main focus of my year and the main focus of this project to be looking back as a means of looking forward, observing my own history so that I'll be able to see the future more clearly crystallized or use my past and the themes of my life as a blueprint of sorts. I even suggested that the theme for this year's GMWS yearbook to be hindsight 2020. I believe that looking at our own stories can be really impactful and can get us really in touch with our humanity. For me, writing this memoir really 
made me aware of my humanity. And it also made me aware of the patterns of humanity as a whole. Memoir is an anthropological exploration. And you may ask, what do I mean by that? Many critics of memoir say that memoir is somewhat narcissistic because you're writing about yourself. And some say that it's not literary. But I would, I would disagree with that because for me, I think memoir is really asking us the question, what does it mean fundamentally to be human? And I think that there is a universality in that concept. I think that we're all really asking ourselves that question. I also think that memoirs resonate not just with the individual, but all of humanity, because a key aspect of memoir is empathy. During my preliminary research, I read several poignant and incredible memoirs recommended to me by my in-school and out-of-school mentors. And I came away from the experience of reading these books with the realization that memoirs really are an invitation for empathy. They're a hand reaching out beckoning the reader forward, asking them, here, come join me, take a moment and immerse yourself in my story and in my world. And that aspect of empathy and really understanding the other and placing yourself in that experience, that is what is so universal and so fundamentally human about memoir. And writing it, there's a hope that the reader may emerge from your story with a small jewel of truth or a new perspective that they can carry with them for the rest of their life, potentially, which I think is an incredible thing. At the beginning of this year, when I first decided on memoir writing for my senior project, I was met with some skepticism, primarily from myself, because as many of you know, I tend to be a little self-critical. I pictured memoirists to be old and accomplished individuals ruminating on a long and fruitful life. But in these new and strange times that we're living in, memoirs can be anything and they can be written at by anyone at any point in time that said i do think it's easier to write a memoir when you're older because you have the comfort and the stability of old age and you have the knowledge of a life well lived for me as a young girl about to graduate high school 19 going on 20 the world doesn't feel so linear. It's not in full focus yet. The themes and threads of my life aren't as long as someone writing from a later vantage point. And so that proved difficult at times during this process to be inspired and to write in the whirlwind of high school and adolescence. And I didn't want to say the C word, but COVID. <laughs> I am changing every single day. I wake up and I am a new person and I meet a new world every day. With the current world that we're living in, it feels like nothing ever stops. And just taking a moment to recognize that and be okay with moving in the right direction even if it's not the route that you previously planned that was a big part of my memoir recognizing that i am constantly in evolution as a human being and i am constantly in a transition and that's why i decided to title my memoir in transition because not only did that allude to my own gender transition, which has been a big part of my life, but it is also a recognition of the fact that all of us as a human collective, whether we like it or not, are moving in a certain direction. And it may appear that we're all moving in different directions, but I think that 
we all have the same goal of empathy, of understanding the other, and having a more peaceful and just world. Another huge part of my senior project was my art. I was inspired by a lot of the memoirs that I read at the beginning of the year because a lot of them included really small endearing doodles that kind of heightened the memoir. Um, this includes the memoir written by my lovely mentor. And I was also really just inspired by small drawings kind of adding light to a page. And so now I'm going to share the screen and show you the art portion of my senior project and my process with that. Okay, so hopefully you can all see this. So initially I was inspired by not only um, small doodles and memoirs, but in newspapers as well. And this one I thought was appropriate for the time since we're all quarantined at home. This woman looks a little frazzled and she's showing up to the party late. And she says, sorry, I'm late. I got caught up at home being happy. So this definitely resonated with me. And I think that it can resonate with a lot of us right now. But just small doodles like these um, to kind of accompany journalistic articles and just pieces of writing can just make it more freeing and approachable and poetic in a way. So this was one of my many inspirations for the project. I was also inspired by the small and intimate doodles in poetry collections, such as The Sun and Her Flowers and Milk and Honey by the poet Ruby Kaur. I just think that poetic verse accompanied with a small simple drawing is a really beautiful thing. And although some parts of my memoir are dense, I also have some passages that are sort of stream of consciousness poems. And so I wanted to make small doodles to accompany that. And so I began to do that. I started with um, pen, like ink pen drawings. And that eventually progressed to me experimenting with watercolor. So this was one of my first attempts at that. And I made this illustration to accompany a passage in my memoir where I talk about my sexuality and my queerness. And I wanted this to represent that in a way. In the passage, I talk about how sometimes queerness makes you feel like you're alienated from yourself and alienated from the world around you. And sometimes you're transported to other realms outside of your human form. And I wanted to capture the metaphysicality and whimsicality of queerness in this illustration. And I guess you could call it a self-portrait. And I just included, you know, the horns and the flowers spreading out of the head um, and showing sort of that transition or a bridge between worlds. And I added watercolor to this. Then I started to really dive into watercolor because I enjoyed it so much. So I started to create drawings like this. I started playing a lot with color and abstraction and texture. I created this drawing because I felt so happy that day. I was spending time with my friends and I wanted to hold on to that feeling of happiness because I think that a lot of us can sometimes feel like everything is going wrong all the time and you don't focus on the good memories and the good moments and I just wanted to hold on to that like golden moment and just cherish it and so that's why I chose the colors and it's totally sort of an external manifestation of my inner world and my inner feelings and that's also why I included the swirling colors and the butterfly as well. Once I created portraits like this, I decided that I wanted to shift the focus of the art portion of my memoir to be more geared towards self-portraits. 
because like I said, memoirs aren't limited to one medium. And for me, I regard self-portraits as memoir. They are a visual memoir because you are looking and observing your face, your anatomy, your physical form, and even your internal world. And you're creating that on a piece of paper. So in a way, it was a perfect way to accompany my writing with portraits of myself and sort of um, thoughts in color. So this was one of the first um, self-portraits that I made um, with acrylic paint and I wasn't feeling great that day um, and I tried to create the face um, being like very detailed and I planned this out completely different but then my emotions sort of took over and I created like that tertiary fiery whirlwind around the face and I think with this, although it's not my most developed, I definitely think that the emotions shine through. And I really appreciate seeing that in my early work. I then started to work with oil pastel. Oil pastel is an incredible medium for me because you feel like you're in control um, and it's also so malleable and you feel like you're sculpting on the paper, which I think is beautiful. And I wasn't thinking about proportions. I wasn't thinking about making things pretty. I just wanted to be loud, colorful, provocative, and I wanted to demonstrate my feelings. And so both of these are manifestations of that, um, just kind of two different moods. On the left, this was, I made this after I was driving um, in the car at night and I saw like um, a beautiful like reflection, the street lights reflecting in the puddles. It was a rainy night and I was feeling very nostalgic and I just wanted to represent that. So I did that on the left and on the right, that is me mid existential crisis, as you can see, because my hands are literally disintegrating. Um, then we started to work on self-portraits in art class, which was really perfect and I was so happy that a huge part of my senior project was so seamlessly incorporated into the GMWS curriculum. And so on the left here, I created this self-portrait. I wanted to focus on color, concaves, convexes, lights, and shadows. It was heavily inspired by Pablo Picasso and Cubism. And on the right is a piece that I made out of newspaper clippings. And all seniors first semester, if they're taking art, are required to make this. This was honestly a really spiritual and empowering process to create this because I am a person who is so influenced by words and the things that I read. I've always loved reading. I love writing and to be able to actually tear apart magazines and books and newspapers and form my face out of words and kind of sculpt the landscape of my face out of like collage was just I, I can't even explain it, but I mean, I, I think it speaks for itself. Um, the fact that I'm a writer and I was making myself out of words. Also, if you see on my hair, it says literary sad woman, which I felt like I really related to at the time. This was another self-portrait that I worked on in my Blythe Winston's class. This was completely and absolutely spur of the moment. Um, I had finished my other work and I just started this piece. I wanted it to stray a little bit more towards realistic, but let's be honest, all of my drawings are more in the surrealist realm, but I definitely wanted to focus on color and really evoke a strong emotion in the viewer. And I wanted to, you know, create like gentle transitions and smooth shading. And this is chalk pastel on paper. This was another self-portrait that I made. And I think this is one of the self-portraits that looks the most like me. 
which is crazy. And I'm so proud of this because it started off as an amorphous, watery blob because Miss Blythe Swinston asked us to make a watercolor portrait of ourselves. And it wasn't working for me. I think that with watercolor, I like it when I'm filling in something, but when I have to create something out of watercolor, I don't feel like I'm in enough control. And I think that the water has too much input in the art piece, like it, it kind of controls things. But I had these blobs of color and I mean, they were beautiful colors. It was like a bluish purpley kind of color and then a nice like deep rich brown and some tertiary like oranges. And I asked Miss Blythe Winston if I could use the splotches of color to guide me in creating my face. And so I decided to go over the splotches with chalk pastel and create my face out of the chaos, which again was extremely meaningful to me to be able to discern my face out of blobs of color and to really create something meaningful. So I created all of these portraits and I was really happy with them to coincide with the writing portion of my memoir, but I wanted to take it a step further. So after begging Miss Blythe Winston and Miss Volpe to stay in fine art for the second semester, I told Miss Blythe Winston that I wanted to create a large oil painting of myself that could be a potential cover of my memoir. And so I decided to do that. Miss Blythe Winston provided me the resources and I got to work. Then quarantine happened and it was hard to get on my feet because oil was a completely new medium for me. So it was it was definitely a difficult process. I also told myself that I wanted the oil painting to resemble Renaissance portraiture and to be as photorealistic as possible, which again was a pretty impossible standard, um, but I tried my best. So this is the final product. Um, I am really proud of this piece. It is bumpy. It's not perfect because I didn't know how to use linseed oil at the beginning of my process, but I'm really proud that you can kind of see the bumps and the ridges and kind of like the fjords of the paint because it's just, it just shows my development and my process as an artist. It's also not completely photorealistic at all, but I feel like the proportions um, are pretty correct and it took me forever to create the face. But I'm just like really proud at how it turned out because it is surreal, but it's also realistic and ultimately it's just fundamentally me. And I don't know if this is going to be the cover of my memoir, but I want to um, work on oil painting in the future, 100%. So I'm going to stop my share. So I had a lot of questions at the beginning of this year when I was starting my project. And I want to read another small excerpt from my memoir that, um, that kind of addresses the pain and the questions that I was dealing with. And I wrote this at the beginning of senior year. And now I think that with the body of work that I currently have, as well as the self-portraits, I think that a lot of these questions that I was asking myself are starting to be answered and come more into focus. Many days have been painful, at least for me, to stay alive and continue living in a world that constantly has told me that my body is wrong. I am a hunk of clay, weathered by time and molded by the hands of others. I've been sculpted into statues of beautiful women, placed on a pedestal for all to see, 
but I've also been pressed down into the earth, crushed by aggressive hands and probing fingers. Will I ever have the power and the ability to sculpt myself, to take charge of my own narrative, or is my existence only based around an expectation, the gaze and perception of another? How can I even begin to claim my power when each day I feel so lost and confused, glued to my mattress, sobbing in the gray hours of the morning? Yes, I'm still angry. Yes, I'm still lost and confused. Yes, I'm still here, trying to conquer the eroding pressures of the world, building the clay upwards into a mountain, grasping at the tendrils of the sun, basking in the kingdom of the sky. I was asking myself these questions at the beginning of the year, and I was thinking about that mountain and thinking of myself as a complex lump of clay and building myself upwards into a mountain. And I feel like with my work, I really am starting to do that. Writing memoir and titling my memoir in transition and really claiming all of that for me was empowering because I became a champion of my own narrative. And that was just so important to me. And I think that was the biggest thing that I took away from this project. This memoir was not easy to write. I wrote passages where I experienced immense joy, but I also wrote about immense pain that I experienced. I wrote about the inherent traumas of growing up as a trans and queer person in the times that we're living in right now. I wrote about my frustrations about senior year and how we weren't able to celebrate the end of the year together. I also wrote about the pressure of hyper visibility and the stress of my modeling career at such a young age and being exposed to industries that were both inspiring and also way over my head. So all of this pain and all of these experiences, I wrote them all down. And yes, it was really hard to process them and relive them. But as I wrote, I was transforming my pain. I realized that I was transforming my pain into something completely different. I was transforming it into something transcendent. That was a joy for me. And that's what I learned about living in transition. So before I take questions, I have a few thank yous. First, I would like to thank my mom. Mommy, I know you're watching this. You're watching this downstairs right below me because I wanted to be in the room alone while I presented. Thank you for being beautiful inside and out, for being my role model. As I was writing, I realized that this isn't just my story, it's our story because I share so much of my life with you and you've provided so much for me as a caregiver. Um, you're just a powerhouse. And I also want to thank you for not getting too angry at me when I got oil paint literally all over the house. So there's that. I want to thank all of you for joining me today and for listening to me and my classmates so attentively. It really means the world to me. I wanted to thank the entire GMWS community for watching me grow up, for supporting my development, um, and for sticking with me um, and believing in me when I didn't even believe in myself. So. Thank you. And it's been almost a decade now that I've been here. This place is my home. I spend my summers here. I spend basically all year here. And it just really means the world to me that I've had such an incredible community and an incredible support system here. 
Next, I would like to thank my in-school mentor, Ms. Caldwell. Not only is Ms. Caldwell one of the best teachers I've ever had, um, and she's also just stupid intelligent, but she also really just helped me with the speech. And she didn't just help me um, talk about what I wanted to, she knew kind of what my general message was, but she said, you know, she pointed out like specific corrections and specific things that she thought that I could change. And sort of like the specificity of her direction really gave me more confidence in my presentation because I didn't want to be um, misunderstood in any way. And so I'm just really happy that I had your support in school. Also, thank you for recommending some amazing memoirs. Next, I would like to thank Ms. Cologne and Ms. Monteleone for helping me through all of my panic attacks, all of my breakdowns, that time in junior year when I decided to spontaneously run off campus. <laughs> Those were the more dramatic moments, but also just in general, supporting me, listening to me, lending your ear to my perspective, allowing me to be vulnerable. I'm so happy to have both of you in my life. It, is really important to me. Um, and also just thank you for guiding me through this process of my senior project and college and all of that. Just, it means a lot. Thank you. Next, I would like to thank Miss Blyce Winston for letting me stay for that extra semester. Um, you gave me so many resources. You introduced me to Gerhard Richter and Xenia Hausner and some of my favorite artists that I know right now. And just the resources and the, and the support that you provided for the art portion of my senior project was really special. And you also saw the artist within me when I couldn't even see, my, see it myself. Next, I would like to thank Ms. Volpe for choosing us. You chose us. You didn't have to, but you did. And you took up our class in such an incredible way. You've been there 100%. I can tell that your love is unconditional and I feel the same way back to you. You really are just an incredible person and a, a huge figure in this community. And it just really means the world to me that I was able to work so closely with you. And I think that the class shares this sentiment as well. Next, I would like to thank my out of school mentor, Lena Dunham. Lena, you are so amazing. I don't, I, I love our small FaceTimes because they just feel like these bursts of inspiration. It just felt like opening a window in my mind. It was so exciting to work so closely with um, another creative in this way. Um, not even just a creative, but a creative genius at that. Thank you also for sending me like 25 memoirs. Unfortunately, I haven't read all of them, but I appreciate you um, exposing me to the amazing writing of Mary Carr and Hilton Alls. Also, thank you for just allowing me to be vulnerable, giving me space and helping me live into my inner riot girl. So thank you. And finally, I would like to thank my class. You all seriously blew me away with your presentations. I'm not gonna lie. It was incredible to see you all come together in that way. I know that we fight sometimes and I know that our class isn't perfect and we're dysfunctional and disorganized, but it's such a special group because all of our lives by fate or something else, we all touched each other in a really special way this year. You all challenged me and you taught me so many things about myself. And I'm just so happy and grateful that I got to spend this year with you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ariel. That was truly an incredible presentation. Uh, loved your passage readings and your 
beautiful paintings and artwork. It's really incredible what you've been able to accomplish. Um, the first question is from Gabe, what do you think it means to be human? Tough one. Oh, okay, <laughs> coffee. Um, <laughs> I think that um, what it means to be human is having experiences like this, like writing a memoir, um, really, being self-aware. I think self-awareness, um, connection, and empathy are, were all really important pillars of this project, and they're all really prevalent themes in my life. Great. Mr. Rowe says, your passages are beautifully poetic. Through your writing and observation of your life and experiences, have you been able to perceive anything about yourself that's constant rather than changing? That's a really good question. I actually was going to mention this in my presentation, but I was obviously like nervous, oh, very nervous. Um, but there are, I feel like the core of myself and like the, the themes of my life are unchanging because I think that I really connect to specific values that are really true for me. And when you read a book, a character may develop, but who they are fundamentally doesn't change. And I'm so happy to have a basis of myself and to have enough self-knowledge to really know who I am. And I think that my wonderful mother helped me out with this a lot, as well as the whole community at Green Meadow just really helped me like nurture that strong foundation of self so that I'm able to grow from there. Absolutely. Uh, how long did it take you to make the memoir? Okay, so I, um, I'm not finished with the memoir. It's an ongoing project that I hope to continue into this upcoming year. But um, it took me all year. I didn't start the summer before um, because I was working and I just wanted to um, think about what I wanted my project to look like more. Um, I wrote the bulk of my memoir in the fall and winter, and in the spring it was harder to find inspiration, like I said, because of the craziness of the world, current events. It was just harder to focus and find that discipline. Um, but I definitely think that the work that I created, it just definitely has um, a special like flavor and uniqueness to it because I wrote it in such a chaotic time in my life and a time of change where I'm sort of on the precipice or on like the the border of a new chapter and so I definitely think that that brought like a uniqueness to my writing that I'm really grateful for and I wouldn't have um, really had that before this so in a way, I guess I'm saying that I am grateful for, you know, the craziness of 12th grade, um, because I definitely think that um, it gave my writing um, a uniqueness to it. Like it's a little, it's a little time capsule or something. Great. I'm just going to do two more questions. Greetings from Miss Crow. Your memoir is very moving. Thank you for sharing. Will you continue to add to this collection of work as you grow and develop after high school? And someone else is asking if you're thinking of publishing, so. Yes, so, okay, first of all, I can't believe Ms. Crow is here. I love you, I miss you. Um, I wanna thank everyone for showing up, it's crazy. But um, yes, so this project um, is ongoing, definitely. Um, I'm really passionate about it. I love writing. I want to do writing in the future. I want to write more memoirs. I want to write novels. Um, and I also want to translate my writing to more mediums like film and performance and screenwriting and that kind of thing. So writing is definitely a huge theme in my life. And I want to publish this and not just self-publish it. Like eventually I do want to publish it for real. I want it to be on the bookshelf. Um, I want the cover to have like a buttery and glossy texture. I'm taking up way too much time, but like, I just like, I want it to be on the shelf at Barnes and Noble. Um, I want to have that like satisfaction of getting it like really published. And so I definitely do plan on doing that in the future. And I don't know how long that will take me personally, but um, yeah, it's definitely an ongoing process and it's a big part of my life right now. 
Great. And last question, Lazuli says, absolutely incredible, Ariel. At the beginning of your presentation, you said, the world doesn't feel so linear. It's not in focus yet. Do you think that part of the human experience is to strive for that focus? And do you think we will ever find it? Yeah, well, I think that part of the human experience is really like the confusion of it all. Like, I, I think that is definitely part of the process. But um, like I said in this presentation, like for the memoir, I really wanted to um, synthesize like all different parts of my life and incorporate it into a memoir. And I think that we all have to do that at some point and like come to terms with that at many different points in our life. Um, I think that there's like that aha or like that crisis moment where you're like, oh my god, wait, I need some like self-reflection and I need to like look back at my actions and look back at what I've created in my life for myself and use that to see where I'm headed. So sort of that like synthesis of like emotion, spiritual life, physical life, like all of that like put into um, a little capsule I think is important for us to do. I don't know if that's what it means to be human, <laughs> but I think that that's part of the process, I guess. Yeah. Great. Thank you again so much. Read the comments because there were so many compliments. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs> and now we will be moving on to Kashem. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, maybe a little technical. Okay, there we go. These songs are in my veins. The same songs my ancestors used to sing across the motherland's plains. It is a cracked foundation of unknown cultural strands, strands that have been tampered with. But even though they have been pulled, stretched, and long, my heart still beats and pumps unbroken songs that are righteously mine. The drum is a reflection of me and those overseas that were beaten with the same amount of frequency so each time i hit the drum it is a reminder of the truth deep under the bark of each tree is pieces of my history no man can distance me from the rhythms buried in soil my soul making this shell of wood unbreakable stone i listen to my heart it sings songs that are broken pieces of home <laughs> school 
I was never sitting down. Teacher said my feet barely hit the earth. I was always doing something. Every surface was an instrument, whether it was my desk or my pencils or my hands. I had this fire to express myself through movements and rhythm. I didn't choose the drum, the drum chose me. The journey with the drum was was hard because with, with my mentor Masha Bani, which is which is what I wanted to tell you about, which is a funny story. He doesn't help me. He doesn't like he doesn't say, here's the steps we need to go through, so let's do them. He says, here's the drum figure out where you need to go with it we got a shell right i didn't i didn't want to have to cut down a tree and carve out the shell myself because it would take so much time and effort and technology that i'm not able to use right now the hardest part was roping and skinning so i think that was the part where i really had to sit down with the drum and me and figure out what I needed to do. And the drum started, you know, speaking to me and stressing me out. I, so I put on some music, I burned some incense. Uh, I sat there with the drum for maybe an hour and then I just started working. I put the uh, skin in water, in cold water, let it sit for about 24 hours, less than that, 15. And the next day I put the skin on, there's two rings there's a bottom ring and a top ring. You have to, to put the bottom ring on to, to even out the skin. And the skin has to go on so the hair is upward. So the skin is goat skin. So you can see the spine of the goat through, through, the, through the skin. And uh, then you put the top ring on top of the skin and you, you fold it to where the um, bottom ring and the top ring apply pressure to the skin, which stretches it. Once, once the skin is on, you have to start roping. He didn't just tell me, you know, sit with the drum and figure it out. He told me what not to do. He told me, he told me, don't do this. Like, you know, don't don't overhydrate the skin. Don't don't start roping before the skin is on. There's there there. He set the pathway for me. He set the road for me. He he he, he made the direction, and I had to go that direction myself. He didn't want to have to, you know put me in a carriage and trail me along. He said, that's the way you're supposed to go, go that way. When you know you're doing the right thing on the drum and you know that it's coming together the way it's supposed to, everything falls into line. Everything is like a puzzle. When, you, when you've gone around and you've done this, this V weave up and down around the drum, there's, there's a second weave you have to do in between the Vs that you made on the drum. Funny that that happened because the 
traditionally the drum is, is used to call usually and usually children because the drum was used to storytell to kids their history and their culture so this is my brother his name is Ucha we've been drumming together since diapers since the drum was put in both of our hands Hey, good afternoon. Can I can everyone hear me fine? I just want to make sure the audio is good. Okay. So yeah, good afternoon. My name is Kashem Williams. My senior project was studying the djembe and making a djembe. Um, so right, the term djembe is is uh, from a, a bambara saying. Which means we're all gathering together, like I said in the video. Um, so, and I feel like that's a, a very core uh, definition of the djembe because the djembe has this essence of calling when you play. It just brings, it, it just brings a lot of people's attention and, and it like mesmerizes people. And I think that's, that's, it's, it's very clever that they had the term djembe as, you know, the name of the drum. So the drum consists of three spirits, the tree from which it came from, and the animal, of course, which is the goat skin on top of the drum, and the maker of the drum. The djembe is, is I would say, over 800 years old. It originated in West Africa in specifically Mali, um, under a group, an ethnic group called the Mandink. The Mandink have what we call the Zumu, the Zumu um, uh, Numu. Um, and the Numu are, they're, they're blacksmiths, they're like blacksmiths. And they were the original creators of the drum. So they would, the blacksmiths would custom make the drum to fit the drummer, just like a knight, his armor, say, like a blacksmith. So, so the making of the drum is spiritual and the mandink would hold these, these, um, these rhythms and songs sacred. And they would use these rhythms and songs to storytell. And they would tell the, the youth and the children about their culture and their history through music. And, and the storytellers are called the griots. The griots are leaders. And not, not just leading the tribe, but leading spiritually and, 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 in, and in cultural awareness. So they would tell these stories to familiarize the children with their heritage and their background. So there's many stories of um, how the djembe was discovered. But one of the most common stories of how the djembe was discovered, it was discovered by women. And the women, you know, they pound the millet with uh, mortar and pestle in Africa. Um, so one day, one of the women were pounding the millet and broke a hole in the mortar. And the way the, the hole structured in the mortar created the shape of the shell of a drum. So they, they thought, huh, from there. There's many, there's many other stories, but that's one of the most common stories, I would say. But there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of stories. 
So from, from speaking of the shell, I'm gonna show you my drum and, and the process of the roping. Give me a second. Can you see five? Good, okay. So this is traditional roping in Guinea and Nigeria. Mind you, the roping I, I briefly talked about in the video, but the, the roping is very difficult and it takes a lot of time. So this drum is not finished. It's not tuned enough. You can see the skin is on, but it is not tightened enough to play because I'll show you the slack. All of this rope has to be we uh, weaved through the entire drum, right? So I go around and I'd weave and it's not easy. It takes a lot of work and it's, it's stressful on your hands and it's just hard, it's hard because the top of the drum is gonna get stretched out when, when you're pulling the ropes because the tuning of it is like, like, a, like a guitar. When you tune a guitar, you, you pull the, the notches for the strings to get tighter, right? For it to go higher or lower. It's the same thing with the drum. The tighter the skin, the higher the um, frequency of the drum. So it's not, it's not easy to do. And um, it was very difficult. So once the, um, sorry, once the, uh, the, the, the drum is tightened enough, I, this was longer, obviously I had more skin. You can see the skin has shrunk a lot. I had to cut a lot of it off because, because as the drum gets tighter, I managed to tighten it enough to where I can cut the ends a little bit as the drum gets tighter, I'm gonna end up cutting more of the slack off so it's easier to play, right? So yeah, I mean, that's, that's where the drum is at right now. There's a lot of stages that need to be worked on, but yeah. So I'm gonna show you some traditional playing and um, the basics of what you need to know to be a djembe player. Uh, with this drum, since that one's not tuned enough yet. Um, so, right. The, um, the songs that I played in the video were, the first song you heard was Funga in the beginning in the intro, which is a welcome song. Um, and this, and later on, I played uh, "Cuckoo" with my brother, which is a harvest song. So there's a lot of a lot of different songs for specific traditions in the culture. So, for instance, if if I'm gonna play a welcome song, these welcome songs were were uh, com communication through tribes, for example. So a tribe that is quite a distance from another uh, tribe would, would have their lead djembe player communicate with them through the song. And they would commu communicate through how loud the drum is from, from the distance. So, right, so there's only three tones on the drum. There's bass, tone, slap. And um, when, you, when you're hearing everyone playing together, it sounds like there's, there's so many tones, but there's only three. But when we play all together, it creates, it creates more than that. So um, the leader, as you could see, when I, my brother and I were playing, I played a break. And the break is this. You probably remember hearing it. Which is this, the, a signal, basically, that the leader gives to the entire, to everyone, to start and to finish. So it's very important when you're playing with a group to pay attention to the leader. Even though you're playing in a group with everyone else, it's important to always be listening because when you hear that break, you have to stop. And when you hear that break, you have to start. So that's very important. There's other breaks that are played traditionally in the songs, like intros to the song. But the main break when you're finishing a song would be that, that break. So I'm going to play 
um, a little bit of Funga, which is the welcome song I played in the beginning. And then I'm going to play a little bit of my own piece for you. Hope you like it. Back up a little. See me. It's good. We can't see the drum. Okay. Can... Thank you for telling me. It's a smaller drum than the, than the one I'm making. So I've had this since I was five, maybe. <laughs> Long time. So. Better? Can you see it a little bit? It's the height, but it's okay. Good. All right. We're having a little bit of issue with sound. I think it's Zoom, but the audio is bad. That's why I asked you before in the beginning. Yeah.
I hope the audio wasn't too poor on that. Yeah. But yeah, I'll, um, I, I would like to thank uh, my mentor, Masha Bani, for one, showing me the construction of the drum and understanding it more. And uh, my in-school mentor, Chayla Crane, for just helping me in general with the whole thing. And um, my family, my brother for drumming with me, as he always has, and my parents for showing me a huge part of my culture. Uh, I'll take any questions now. Thank you so much, Kishem. Although the audio wasn't great, we could feel your energy even through Good. this virtual medium. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that with us. You're a very, very talented uh, Jeffrey player and it just shines through your enthusiasm. Just watching you play is really beautiful. Um, and I feel like you've really been sort of a, a spiritual leader and storyteller for our community. And we're just so happy to have had you with us. Um, thank you. The first question is, what do you love about drumming? Um, oh, that's, that's, I don't know. I would say um, off the top of my head, what I love the most about it is the fact that instantly I had a relationship with it, right? Like I was saying, you know, immediately, I'm like, my feet would never hit the ground. I was always drumming on something. Like it's just the relationship I have with the drum. And not to mention that it's such a huge part of, you know, my culture, I would say. Absolutely. Ian asks, are you planning to teach about African history as well as teaching about African music? Absolutely. What are some of the songs you know? On the drum. Uh, I would say, I know a lot of, I, I know a couple of songs, you know, there's the songs you heard, which was Funga, um, Cuckoo. Um, I don't know if you, Manjani was in the, was in the um, video, but there, yeah, there's a lot of songs. There's a lot of traditional songs that I learned. Someone asks, where are your ancestors from? Africa. <laughs> Uh, Kishem, I loved your presentation. Can you explain what sorts of dances people do when listening to this drumming, if any? So, right, yeah, that's a good question. The, the, the dancing is, is a huge part of the storytelling, not just the drumming, right? Because the dancers demonstrate a visual part of the history and the storytelling. So a lot of the dancing you'll see, if I mean, you may not understand it if you're just seeing it, without a, a, a background on it. But a lot of the dancing you'll see is movements based off the, the stories. For instance, the, the, um, the story of how the drum was discovered. There would be a lot of dances similar to the women pounding the millet and you can see it in the dances if you, if you pay attention. About how long has it taken you to make your drum so far? Mm, month it's taking it's taken a, a while i you know i haven't been counting the days luckily but but um <laughs> it's uh it's taken some months uh from mateo do you like basketball or drumming more drumming i love <laughs> basketball drumming um there's a couple of invitations for you to to come back and share your drumming with the children at the school um, last question. The poetry you spoke to in the beginning also showed fantastic and subtle rhythm. Do you find a connection between your drumming and your poetry? Yes, yes, definitely. The, the, the rhythm speaks in different cadences, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so, so much uh, for your amazing presentation. Thank you to all of the presenters today. This was such a nice way to end the senior projects. 
And um, hopefully we'll be able to maybe show your video again so that people can hear your drumming more clearly next yes. time. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you all for coming.